Why don't we start? Okay, we'll start today. So um, before I start my talk, I just wanted to embarrass my future uh, fellow pediatric oral neurologist. It's David Shank's birthday today. Oh. Oh. Happy birthday. Hopefully. Is that a baby um, picture? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's not Asian. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, so uh, this evening, I'm it. really excited to talk to you about a topic that's all right. I like this. Um, that I've become really passionate about throughout residency, um, and that's the issue of, of uh, newborn hearing screening. Um, I spent some time in Peru, uh, getting to know their system of newborn their, their system of newborn hearing screening kind of in its infancy. And um, it made me interested to look uh, back more at, at our system here in the US and how it developed. And in doing this research, I, I realized that it's a pretty messy story. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on in parallel, uh, people working on uh, scientific innovations, people working on the political side, um, advocacy. And it, it created kind of this patchwork quilt that came to be what I think is a tremendously successful um, implementation of a, of a very important program. So, um, anyway, I, I also want to start by acknowledging Dr. Papelka. Um, he helped me initially with my project in Peru and spent uh, two hours going through basically his wealth of knowledge on this topic, which he's also very passionate about. So it's been a real, uh, been a real uh, resource for me and, and also a, um, a great mentor. And then I also wanted to acknowledge Dr. Messner as well for her efforts in implementing newborn hearing screening here at LPCH. Um, you know, as successful as these programs have been, implementing this stuff at any given hospital is it's a huge amount of effort. And I think Dr. Messner is, is one of the those who uh, spent the most amount of time and effort in doing that. So, Anyway, in terms of the outline of my talk, I'm going to start by talking about the case for early hearing detection and intervention. And I'm going to kind of change my language now. Newborn hearing screening is kind of an outdated terminology. And now we talk about early hearing detection and intervention because it's very important not just to identify the hearing loss, but also to do some sort of intervention. Um, then I'll talk about the evolution of screening technologies. Uh, including uh, behavioral screening technologies and also uh, physiologic screening. Then I'll talk about the pathway to universal uh, <coughs> protection and intervention in the U.S. And then finally talk about uh, some of the areas where we still have a lot of room to grow and improve this program. So the case for early hearing detection and intervention. Uh, Prelingual hearing loss is a really common problem. Um, it, the estimates vary throughout the world, but in the U.S., people put it somewhere between one and three per 1,000, or even sometimes as high as five. If you include moderate and unilateral, it can be estimates as high as 50. And if you look at NICU graduates only, the, the numbers are closer to uh, two to four and 100. So it's a common problem. Second uh, reason why, uh, why this is important is hearing loss uh, decreases access to opportunity. So on average, even with American Sign Language, graduates from uh, high school um, who are hearing impaired are typically at a fourth to fifth grade reading level. And even mild hearing loss can be disabling. Um, I found a study that showed a one grade delay for every 10 decibel uh, hearing loss greater than 25 decibels. So that's pretty mild, but it does have an impact on, on speech and language development. Anybody know who this guy is? Blair Simmons. Yes. So Blair Simmons was a former Stanford uh, otolaryngology chairman and also a tremendous advocate for uh, early intervention. <coughs> um, so he, he published this paper in 1980, uh, The Importance of Early Intervention with Severe Childhood Deafness. And in the paper, he had a few interesting points. Only 12% of the students enrolled in the final year of schools for the deaf read at or above the fourth grade level. Uh, graduates of Gallaudet University, which is this university in DC that's uh, strictly for the deaf, had the lowest GRE scores in the nation. And five-sixths of deaf adults are manual laborers. Now, he wasn't saying this to put down the deaf community, but rather to uh, highlight the fact that uh, the argument that those living with ASL uh, can access equal opportunity. It's just not true. Uh, additionally, hearing loss is costly to society. So education for the deaf is 10 times more costly versus mainstream education for hearing kids. 
Uh, deaf people's incomes are, are much lower uh, than, than those of uh, people with normal hearing. And then there's a tremendous societal cost, so the medical costs, education, rehab, and welfare. Uh, for a normal hearing individual, their cost to society is about $800,000. And for a hearing impaired individual, it's 1.3 million. So that's almost a half a million dollar difference. And that adds up to a $2.1 billion difference per year in the United States. And that does not factor in the lack of productivity of that, of that uh, deaf individual. So clearly, this is a big problem. And it has a tremendous impact on <coughs> individuals and on society. So the next step was determining, so, so why do we have to identify this early? Why can't we just? you know, wait for these kids to declare themselves and intervene at that point and help them live normal lives. And uh, there have been uh, several studies um, throughout the years showing that, um, number one, uh, it takes a while to identify these kids. So these studies all were published in the 1980s, and they show the average age of detection without screening to be uh, one and a half to almost three years old. Um, Additionally, there were a series of studies that showed that early intervention on kids with uh, severe and profound hearing loss can lead to improved speech and language development. Uh, one of the earliest studies in 87 compared uh, groups of severe and profoundly deaf infants, and the first group uh, was diagnosed at around one year and intervened by 14 months, and the second group was diagnosed at about a year and a half and intervened at about two years. And the language scores were significantly improved in the first group, so this was just sort of laying the groundwork. This is another sort of quaint study published in 1995. You can see all the uh, participants are actually represented by the first names there. But you can see that uh, all the kids had hearing aids by six months in this particular cohort. And this was compared with a prior study where it was a cohort of children who were diagnosed at two years and three months of age. And it compared the age at their first symbolic vocalizations. Uh, those who were diagnosed early had their first symbolic vocalizations at 13 and a half months, whereas the later diagnostications uh, had uh, this important milestone in, in, in speech development as late as 40 months. This study by uh, Christine Yoshinage Tano, who's a uh, famous uh, audiologist in Colorado, uh, was kind of the landmark study showing that early intervention really is crucial. So they looked retrospectively at 150 infants <coughs> with severe and profound hearing loss. Half of them were diagnosed before six months, and half of them uh, later than six months. And they applied objective measures of their language and cognitive ability. And so as you see here, in this column, it's the kids who were uh, diagnosed from zero to six months, and then all these columns, uh, seven months or greater. And in the y-axis, they show the adjusted mean total language quotient which is essentially um, the percentage of language abilities they would have compared to a normal hearing kid. And those that had interventions before uh, six months of age had about 80% of the language ability of a normal kid, whereas those identified later were more like 55% of a normal kid. This is also a, a reflection of, of similar findings. Here, this is a um, representation of what was called the, the cognitive quotient minus the language quotient. So they, they tested the kids' cognitive abilities and their language abilities and tried to determine if the kids' language was living up to their cognitive abilities. And so in the kids who were diagnosed early, the difference between their language abilities and their cognitive abilities was substantially less than those who were diagnosed later. So you know, these were smart kids, but they were severely delayed in terms of their language. So you know, the, the four main points I make for um, early hearing detection and intervention are prelingual deafness is common, hearing impairment decreases access to opportunity, hearing loss is costly to society, and early intervention leads to improved speech and language development. Um, one final point on this last issue, you know, the intervention in this study was hearing aids and intensive speech and language therapy. This was before the era of cochlear implant, and I think that is very interesting when we consider um, the vast majority of the world now, it does not have uh, any kind of newborn hearing screening and certainly won't ramp up cochlear implant <clears throat> programs for you know, uh, many, many years. I think it just goes to show that interventions besides cochlear implants do have substantial value. Um, also, I think one thing to, to touch on when talking about any screening program is uh, sort of the ethics of screening. So in 1968, Wilson <coughs> published these 10 criteria that any screening test should meet in order to be 
um, considered ethical. And the main kind of take home of these is that you shouldn't test for something you can't intervene upon. And again, this comes up often in discussion of, of um, implementation of screening in the developing world. And I think you know the data shows that that is something that's worthwhile to move forward. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of screening technology. So there's two main approaches to screening infants. Um, the first approaches uh, were behavioral approaches. So, um, you know, looking at the babies and trying to determine whether they could hear or not based on that. And then as time went on, uh, physiologic approaches became uh, available. So to start talking about the behavioral approaches. So uh, these are portraits of Irene uh, Rosetta Goldsack Ewing and her husband Alexander William Ewing. They were uh, this dynamic duo at the University of Manchester in England. They were both teachers at a school for the deaf and uh, tremendous advocates, early advocates for um, uh, verbal and, and uh, oral um, sort of mainstreaming of deaf kids and, and sort of discouraged them from using uh, sign language and, and, and wanted them to develop language. So what they developed was something called Ewing's Distraction Test. And this is sort of the precursor to all uh, visual response audiometry and those sorts of things. <coughs> so what you did was you had uh, the mom with the baby sitting on her lap uh, facing one person. And then a person standing kind of behind the mom would make a noise either with like a teacup or a, you know, ruffle some paper. And the observer would be distracting the kid with a toy of some kind. And so the noise had to be... <coughs> Uh, meaningful enough to, you know, to, to evoke a response in the child. Um, and interestingly, they, they actually you know, tested some of these noises that they were using for frequencies. And so they, you know, the ruffling of the paper is similar in frequency to the S sounds in the, the high register. And so they could get some data about frequency. Um, but of course, you know, there were no clear thresholds. It was highly operator dependent. But the, U, the Ewings were, were actually um, pretty beloved by um, the uh, you know the establishment in the United Kingdom, and they were actually both knighted. And I think partially because of their own uh, charisma, a lot of these behavioral te techniques were used in the UK well into the 2000s when physiological techniques were, were widely available. So that's kind of an interesting point. So next, I'm going to talk about um, Marion Downs, and I think of anybody I think in this whole story, I think she deserves probably the lion's share of the credit. Um, she was a stay-at-home mom from Minnesota, and um, in uh, the 1950s, um, she, her kids had kind of grown up, and she decided she wanted to go back to college. So she they had moved to Colorado, and she went down to the University of Colorado and said, oh, you know, what programs do you have available? And it was right after World War II, so there were GI <laughs> at many of the different buildings. She said, well, I'm going to go to the, the building where the line is shortest. And that was sort of where audiology and speech and language pathology were. And so Marion Downs became a tremendous advocate for uh, early intervention for, for newborns. And, and um, you know, her motto, she's got this really interesting website at her, um, at the Marion Downs Institute. And the, the, her motto is, there is nothing more powerful in the world an idea whose time has come, and she truly took that to heart, uh, you know, in her life's work. Um, she published uh, what is kind of the Bible of Pediatric Audiology. It's now in its sixth uh, iteration, and really did the groundwork showing that newborns could be screened and, early, and identified before six months of age. So this is kind of her seminal paper showing how she screened newborns and also, you know, how others could potentially do it. Um, published in 1967. And this was innovative beyond what the Ewings were doing in a couple of ways. First, she used objective equipment. So this uh, device is called the uh, <coughs> Ephratron, and it produced a frequency of 3,000 hertz that you could modulate between 60 and 100 decibels. So you could actually get some sense of the baby's threshold. And then her data collection methods were exquisitely uh, technical. So she had pages and pages of you know, what you might expect from babies at different uh, points in their development. She had a numerical scale for uh, your interpretation of, of how they met or did not meet those particular criteria. And then um, the documentation was, was totally standardized. And so I think she took up what could be a potentially very objective and, uh, and, and or sorry, very subjective and non-standardizable process and made it as objective as possible. 
And it was successful. So her, paper, her follow up paper to that methods paper was this report on hearing screening of 17,000 neonates in, in Colorado. And uh, the screening was all done by trained members of the, call the Denver Junior League. So here's some of these ladies here. And her results that, that they got in this group of 17,000 infants actually compare pretty well with, with what we uh, are identifying uh, you know, today. Uh, their prevalence rate was about 1 in 1,000. They had about a 3% rate of false positives. I'm sorry, of, of true positives, so uh, 500 false positives. And, and that's comparable to a lot of the, the data, at least in the mid-90s. And then um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but uh, she also identified kind of early that you couldn't just look at high-risk babies. There are a lot of babies with absolutely no risk for hearing loss that do have it. And that was kind of a, you know, a, a prescient point in 1969. Additionally, in this paper published um, in 69, they did a survey of physician attitudes. And uh, physicians viewed hearing, hearing screening quite positively. They said, was there an unwieldy number of false positives? The vast majority said no. Should we continue this program? Yes. Should it be mandated? Well, no. The vast majority said they, there shouldn't be any government involvement in this, which is kind of interesting, maybe reflects the state that she lived in. And then uh, any medical legal concerns, uh, and uh, they didn't have much concern about, about that at that time. So I think this study, it's you know three simple pages, but you know I think it's, it's very, very rich in terms of its impact on hearing screening down the line. This was uh, kind of an interesting bridge between, object, or between subjective and physiologic screening, published by our own uh, Dr. Simmons. Uh, he published several papers on a technology called the cribogram. And essentially, the cribogram was a motion-detecting transducer that you attach to a crib. And this is what I found hilarious. 20 times per hour, or 20 times in a 24-hour period in the, in the newborn nursery, they would emit a 92 decibel sound. <laughs> and apparently they would send out like a 60 decibel warning sound. So you know, hearing that, I thought this is, this is destined to fail. <laughs> but be that as it may, um, here you have all the, the individual cribs. Um, this baby has the hiccups. Uh, this baby has just, you know, a pounding heart rate. But uh, you can kind of identify what, what they might mark as positive based on a change in the overall, you know, mm. kind of movement. And, and um, they had a lot of data because, again, they had 20 different tests in a 24-hour period. And they found that if, if they uh, had positive results greater than 20% of the time, then that was a, a good, um, you know, sensitivity to, to say that this child can hear. However, of course, potential problems, high rate of false positives, and it requires many hours of testing. And so in addition to being just you know, terribly um, obtrusive to the, you know, the, the NICU staff, uh, in the you know, 70s and 80s, we kind of transitioned from putting all the kids in the well baby nursery to having the kids be with their mom. And so this, I think that that was probably the biggest weakness is you needed so much data, and it was you know, going to be impossible to collect that. But I think Dr. Simmons, you know, really did, um, was on to something in terms of trying to, to objectify this, this process. <coughs> and there were some takeoffs of, of Dr. Simmons' cribogram. There was something called an auditory response cradle that was used in the UK for a long time. It was a shortened um, test, but it was based on, on the, the infant's movements, and that was, that was um, phased out as well. So now I'm going to kind of move on to the physiologic um, methods of, of screening newborns, and um, they really were kind of, yes. Do you take comments in the middle? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually, they still use the cribogram technique when we do behavioral measurements of hearing in mice. In mice? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have a machine that plays a certain beep, and then there's a sensor on the bottom of the cage, and if they jump, then you know they heard it. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Does that plaque know about this? <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to talk about um, the history of the, the sort of the physiologic uh, systems that we, we know so well. So uh, <coughs> autoacoustic emissions, they were actually first observed by a guy named Thomas Gold, who was an Austrian physicist and uh, astronomist, um, who noticed that when um, they would put a sound into the ear canal, the sound that would come back through the tympanic membrane didn't match what they would expect given the, you know, the, the fluid waves and the impedance. 
And ultimately, it was discovered that uh, the, the sounds going in were actually being modulated by the, the outer hair cells. Um, and uh, they could measure that, that change, and that was uh, something that was found, was called uh, autoacoustic emissions. So there are two types, spontaneous. Not all people have spontaneous. They're actually not terribly well understood as to why some people have spontaneous OADs. The ones used in newborn hearing screening are transient evoked OADs, which is uh, OADs that are in response to an 84 decibel wideband click stimulus. Um, but uh, audiologists also use distortion product OADs and uh, stimulus frequency OADs um, in, in, their, in their work. Um, uh, Kemp in 1978 basically built upon the work done by Thomas Gold in 1948 in showing that um, you know, these could be used useful for, for hearing testing. So although Thomas Gould doesn't probably get enough credit for discovering them, I think the jump from, um, you know, just incidentally noticing that they were there to using them in, in hearing testing was, uh, was Kemp's uh, discovery. So it's benefits of, of, of OAEs, uh, as we probably know, the, it's a quick test, can be done in 10 minutes, uh, so high throughput, and you don't need complete silence. However, the cons are that it's, it's only testing the cochlea, it's not testing the auditory nerve of the cortex, and you are susceptible to middle ear and external auditory canal fluid. So the next uh, major advance in, in newborn screening technology were the, the uh, brainstem auditory evoked responses. And the team of, of uh, Hecox and uh, Galambos, uh, basically, these, these sorts of EEGs were being done for years in adults, but, but Hecox and, and Galambos made the transition being shown that these could be um, those a, uh, ABRs that you saw in, in, in neonates were, um, you, you could extrapolate from them the same information you got from adults. So one thing we always have to know from boards is, is sort of what each wave in the ABR means. And there's that fun mnemonic E. coli. So the first wave is eighth nerve action potential, second wave is cochlear nucleus, third is olivary complex, fourth is lateral meniscus, and the fifth, of course, is the inferior colliculus. And the fifth wave is, is by far the most reliable and the best um, uh, wave used to interpret whether or not um, ABRs are, are present. So uh, again, automated ABRs, uh, the pros are that it's a complete assessment of the auditory nerve and cortex. Um, however, it takes at least 30 minutes uh, and can require a very quiet setting and has more susceptibility to artifacts since you do need to have the electrodes on the infant's head. Um, so this was a, an interesting topic that I actually got into with uh, Dr. Papelka. Um, this is his study from 2004, actually looking at, so what's better, you know? Uh, autoacoustic emissions, you know, we can test a lot of babies really fast, but there's a pretty high, or a higher false positive rate. And, you know, what is, you know, what are sort of the, the pluses and minuses to try to, to do both? And so they tested 300 neonates and uh, did both OADs and ABRs and got uh, extremely good sensitivity and specificity and <coughs> unheard of positive predictive values. So, uh, you know, based upon this paper, there's really good evidence that doing both procedures is, is uh, ideal. Uh, additionally, do you have any other comment on that? No. Okay. <laughs> um, additionally, uh, this is another paper with a, a, larger, a larger group that shows that not only uh, is doing combined procedures, um, you know, good in terms of the audiology of it, but also uh, the cost of it is actually less because the cost of following up on the false positives that you get from the autoacoustic emissions um, is actually greater than the cost of initially doing the ABRs. All right. So interestingly though, in spite of you know, work showing that combined testing is, is uh, useful, uh, there's very little standardization in protocols used. So you can see uh, there are some, uh, so all, all these tests are done before hospital discharge, but there's a lot of heterogeneity into you know, what is the order that they're done, what is used as a con confirming test. Um, so I think we do have some room to grow in that regard. So just in review, um, in terms of the evolution of screening technology, uh, <coughs> the first people to really uh, systematically screen babies were, were the Ewings back in 1944. And then Marion Downs uh, made a great leap forward with her 
doing more objective behavioral testing. Dr. Simmons tried to make the bridge between uh, subjective behavioral testing and, and more physiologic methods. And uh, both uh, Kemp and, and Hecox built on, uh, on some very interesting physiologic properties of the ear um, to develop those tests. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we came from acknowledgement that early detection is really important, and now we have some technologies to do it. So how did this become uh, the law of the land? So um, in 1965, uh, a guy named Homer Babbage was the uh, commissioner of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And he was uh, commissioned to write a report on basically the status of, of deaf education in the United States. And so he looked at 920 graduates of deaf schools in the 1960s, and they all, as Dr. Simmons observed, had low reading levels and mostly manual labor jobs. And at this time, he recommended development of nationwide implementation of university applied procedures for early identification and evaluation of hearing impairment and uh, stress maximum use of residual hearing. So this was the first time that was, this was really on the radar of the federal government uh, and, and uh, brought to the attention of the policymakers. In parallel with uh, what was going on in Washington, um, Marion Downs back in Colorado was very motivated to get the healthcare providers on board with this. And so she uh, helped to found the Joint Commission on Infant Hearing, or the JCIH. And in 1969, they had their first meeting, which was uh, a meeting of audiologists um, from the American Speech Language Hearing Association. And then uh, there were otolaryngologists there, as well as pediatricians. Um, and the, the Joint Commission actually has met um, every couple of years since 1969 and made uh, very influential recommendations on uh, how to implement newer technologies to, to really maximize uh, detection and intervention. But interestingly, their first report in 1970 said that, you know, we are actually not ready for wide-scale behavioral testing given the inconsistencies. And they, modified that in 1972 to say, okay, well, we'll we, we do think that, you know, universal behavioral testing is probably not feasible, but we do think that infants in these high-risk categories should be tested. So family history, torches, uh, physical defects, low birth weight, and uh, hyperbilirubinemia. anemia. And then when they met again in 82, they added bacterial meningitis and low APGARs at birth. So these were sort of used throughout the 70s and early 80s as uh, the criteria used to screen, you know, used to determine who got screened. Then in 1988, uh, C. Edward Coop became a Surgeon General, and he is actually a very interesting figure. He was appointed by Ronald Reagan. He's a pediatric surgeon at uh, CHOP, and he was his politics were definitely uh, sort of right wing, but he he was said to be very. Um, it, I, I read the quote, and it was something like, never was there an, uh, um, s someone who stuck so strongly to his ideology who was so uh, influenced by the truth. So he was a person who could look at data and extrapolate from the data and, and, um, <coughs> and, and change his mind. So um, in 1988, he said, hearing impaired children who receive early intervention require less costly special education services later. I'm optimistic. I foresee a time in this country when no child reaches his or her first birthday with an undetected hearing impairment. Uh, so in part due to, uh, to Dr. Coop's passion, uh, in 1990, there became, they came up with this initiative called Healthy People 2000. And there were uh, dozens of different parameters of health that were part of this. But I think partially because of Dr. Coop and partially because of uh, the Joint Commission, uh, infant hearing was a priority as part of Healthy People. And again, it, the Healthy People initiative didn't really recognize anything new, but it came with a federal tracking and a federal mandate and access to some federal funding to start to implement these programs. Um, so there was a momentum going on in, in the you know, professional societies. There was momentum going in Washington. We now had a federal mandate in 1990. Um, I think that the next sort of big milestone was determining, you know, who do we actually need to screen and what is the science behind it. Uh, this paper published in 1991, showed they, they interviewed parents of 70 kids ages 6 to 9 with severe sensory neural hearing loss, and they asked them, you know, which of these risk factors would you have met? And looking back, only 
would have met criteria for screening. So a full 50% of them would have been missed. I think that's a really important point in this conversation that that's why it's so important that we have universal screening. You can't, you can't just screen those at highest risk. And they did say that 63% would have been screened if NICU admission were included <coughs> as, a, as a criterion. And again, I just want to remind you that Marion Downs is pretty awesome because back in 69, she had about that same amount of uh, percentage of, of those that would have been missed. Here are her kids with, with syndromic and genetic hearing loss, and then there were nine that were you know, of unknown etiology. And a lot of different studies confirmed this. So you know, these are all studies looking at uh, you know, percentage of kids that would have gotten screened with risk factors, and it's all pretty abysmal. So in 94, the Joint Commission got back together and modified their um, recommendations uh, and, and recommended that all infants, not just those high risk, could get screened by three months, with intervention by six months. And then uh, sort of another next step by the year 2000 uh, was this idea that, okay, screening by three months and, and intervention by six months is, is good, but we have all these other diseases that we're screening for actually in the hospital, and the pediatricians actually were the, the movers on, on this issue, uh, saying why don't we just do all of our newborn hearing screening in the hospital at the time of all the other screenings. So uh, in 1999, the American Academy of Pediatrics endorsed you know, hospital-based screening and Thus, uh, the one three six rule, or screening by one month, uh, diagnosis by three months, and intervention by six months, became uh, kind of the mantra. However, as late as 1999, skepticism remained as to whether this was uh, a good idea or not to, to actually have universal screening. So, Jack Paradise is a an otolaryngologist at the University of Pittsburgh, and his research is actually really interesting. He was uh, kind of the guy who headed up the study showing that putting tubes in kids with serous otitis <coughs> media does not change their speech and language outcomes in um, the majority of cases. And so he's always been a little bit of a naysayer yeah. and a, he's a devil's advocate. He's a pediatrician. No. Oh, he's a pediatrician. No, oh, okay. Not, oh, you, not an otolaryngologist. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yeah, I, I only found one little tiny photo of him, and, and uh, I think I think he also had an appointment in the Department of Otolaryngology at Pittsburgh. Yes. Maybe that's why I was confused. Sure. But anyways, um, so he he wrote m multiple papers, kind of being the devil ass advocate as to why universal screening was a bad idea and why high risk screening was adequate. And so he, his first point was, you know, the high risk data are are adequate. He says, you know, only a minority, perhaps one third, are not going to fall in the registry. And he says one can only hope, or one can hope that many of those remaining will be detected at early ages by alert parents, particularly if they are sensitized by educational efforts. The counterpoint to that is, well, you know, just talking about the, the second, the, the first point here, creating a high risk registry isn't just as simple as, you know, you know, having a kid come to your clinic and, you know. There's a certain amount of effort that goes into actually collecting these kids that are high risk. So that was point number one. And then even if we're, one were to accept the premise that only one in three babies would go undetected if you had just the high risk registry, the prevalence of undetected sensory null and hearing loss would still be one in fifteen hundred, which is higher than PKU, hypothyroidism, galactosemia, maple syrup, urine disease, homocystinuria, biotinidase, deficiency, cystic fibrosis, CAH, high risk anemia, toxoplasmosis, and hemoglobinopathy combined. So Kind of a mouthful, but it goes to show that you know he didn't really have a leg to stand on in terms of uh, you know that statement. The second point uh, was that there were an unacceptable number of false positives with uh, newborn screening, with newborn hearing screening. He said that the uh, average uh, positive predictive value was kind of in the range of four to five. However, as time has gone on, um, <coughs> the first point is that. Um, Basically, positive predictive value depends on prevalence of the disease, and there's been a lot of disagreement about just how prevalent this is, and, and what what actually we're talking about. Are we talking about just profound, or are we talking about mild, moderate, profound? Are we talking about unilateral? And and his numbers, if you bring all those possibilities, are, are probably way underestimates. And then um, these numbers are also based on first generation ABR technology. And uh, you know, newer technology numbers are quoted as high as 20% and even as high as in the 80% of the Falcon study. And it's also important to note that the positive predictive value of an abnormal thyroid screen is only 3%. So it's not like you know, newborn hearing screen was out of the ballpark. 
Uh, the third point that Dr. Paradise made was that uh, we haven't tried any alternatives. So no alternative comparably large-scale national effort has ever been attempted to heighten parental awareness of the problem of infant <coughs> deafness and the advisability of early detection. So he said, let's put up billboards, let's hand out pamphlets, let's you know have when they're learning how to breastfeed, also talk to about them about hearing loss. And I think that's a very you know honorable <coughs> effort. I think that there, that's probably a, a great thing to do, given that you know not all. Uh, Pre-label hearing loss is present at birth, but you know it's unlikely that's going to allow for identification of all infants by six months. I think you're going to have kids falling through the cracks. And based upon you know data we've seen before about the average ages of identification being anywhere between one and a half and three, um, you know presumably these parents are paying close attention to their kids, and, and many many are falling through the cracks. So I think that education is important, but it's not the solution. Similarly. Um, yeah, again, and then, and then there was data, you know, kind of concurrently that unscreened newborns in states with screening, the average age still remained greater than 18 months. And then this, I think, is kind of one of the most interesting points that the defender, or the, the sort of the critics of universal screening would bring up. And that was, well, if you tell a parent that their kid has hearing loss, you're going to interfere with the the parent-child bonding relationship. We have virtually no knowledge of the potential impact of false positive identifications on either subsequent parent-child relationships, the performance of necessary, unnecessary subsequent testing, or the carrying out of inappropriate therapeutic measures or procedures. And then he says, there's much evidence from studies on other types of newborn screen that identifying a child as abnormal in the newborn period can engender lasting anxiety on the part of certain parents and can have long-term adverse effects. So there are a lot of, I think, just you know, logical counterpoints to that. Um, but there were also studies done, and a large majority of parents, almost 85%, reported that the benefits of early detection far outweighed any anxiety that may have been caused by learning that their infants did not pass the screening. Uh, you know, consider the very positive feelings of parents whose infants are diagnosed early, and as a result of newborn hearing screening, they're provided early on with the knowledge and information to empower them to help their hearing impaired children achieve their maximum potential. And then I think this third point is also very interesting. Consider also the feelings of the parent, you know, who's got the guilt and anxiety for having missed uh, a hearing loss in their child. So I think, you know, I think this is certainly something worth thinking about, but I think it, it doesn't hold water. So in spite of, uh, you know, critics of, of universal screening, um, it just exploded in the country. I, I think this is incredible. This is the percentage of infants screened by the age of three months. And from January of 1993 to January of 2006, we went from less than 10% to over 95%. And again, I think this is kind of herein lies, you know, how we're going to translate this to the developing world. I mean, we have a medical system in the US that is so heterogeneous. We've got small hospitals, big hospitals, public hospitals, private hospitals, academic hospitals, and all of them were able to implement these programs. And so, you know, taking those lessons learned that, you know, in a short period of you know, 13 years, we could really get this kind of impact is, I think, impressive and, 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 a, and a point, and I think speaks to the point that, it, you know, if, it, if, if we could do it this quickly, how hard could it really be? And here is a uh, grid of all the states that currently have, or I guess in 2011, have uh, mandated newborn screening. So there's a handful of states that didn't have actual mandates, but they um, still have, have programs in place. And, and in 2011, all 50 states had programs. And at that time, the estimate was that 98.5% uh, of newborns were screened within the first month of life. So I think you know this is an incredible accomplishment. Um, and, and really deserves deserves examination and praise. But, you know, there's a caveat here. So this is how far we've come. However, there's still a lot of obstacles and a lot of room for growth. So I think sort of the, the big, the biggest problem with uh, the early detection or, and um, or the, the early hearing detection and intervention programs are the low rates of follow-up. In 2010, the CDC released this survey uh, that they gave to those administering the EDHI programs in their states. And again, very high rates of screening, but if you look at rates of follow-up, <coughs> almost 50% are lost to follow-up. So you have all these kids that are referred that are not getting the uh, follow-up diagnostics nor the interventions. And so at this point, in response to that kind of abysmal 
effort on the part of the you know three and six, uh, they came up with uh, these sort of seven goals for EHDI to improve follow up. So again, uh, the first the first goal was, was pretty well met given the, the high high rates of, of testing. Uh, however, I'll speak a little bit about kind of what efforts were made to uh, improve each of the each of the other goals. So the second goal being diagnostic evaluation by three months, and this is just kind of reiterating the fact that, um, you know, when diagnostic services are being done, they're actually be, being done at a pretty uh, early age. Three, these, these were some of the averages for those that actually did get the diagnostic services compared to, you know, a decade prior. So that was a, a step forward. But again, these were, were still missing half the kids at that time. So the CDC actually hired a consulting firm. And the reasons they identified for this were a dearth of audiologists in this country, uh, lack of equipment, lack of knowledge of health providers, of the urgency of follow-up, uh, difficulty on the part of families, and poor communication between uh, the state administrators of the early detection services and the primary care physicians. Um, similarly, these were the issues that stymied interventions by six months. So th these interventions require significant coordination between the PCPs and the, the, the early detection providers. and. Uh, the PCPs were pretty poorly informed. So this is a 2006 survey of primary care doctors. And they said if you had an infant uh, that came into your clinic who had been diagnosed with severe to profound hearing loss, would you refer them to ophthalmology? Less than 1% would make a referral to ophthalmology. Genetics, less than 10%. Otolaryngology, only three out of four would actually send them to an otolaryngologist. They asked the pediatricians, what's the earliest that an infant can be put with a hearing aid? And almost half of them said that greater than six months. So there was a lot of education that needed to happen with our colleagues. Uh, I'll skip uh, talking about diagnosing um, prelingual deafness that occurs after the uh, neonatal period, because I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But on to the fifth point, uh, infants with hearing loss need to have a medical home. So what they mean by a medical home is having a primary care physician that is kind of the quarterback of their care. And interestingly, 75% um, of infants have a primary care doctor and can name, you know, this is the pediatrician that's going to be there, but only uh, 70, only about a quarter or three quarters of those were actually informed that their their babies that they were going to be following were, um, you know, were uh, were were hearing impaired. So, you know, one if one out of four pediatricians doesn't even know that their patient failed the newborn screen, um, that's a huge hole. I mean, it's 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 a the data, I think, is, is uh, suggestive of uh, you know, a positive trend, but uh, there's a lot falling through the cracks. Uh, finally, uh, every state will have tracking to minimize loss to follow-up. I think this is kind of hilarious, because uh, there's a tremendous uh, variety of ways that states are tracking follow-up. Um, paper forms, email, only 12% were using email. I think this was in about 2006. Uh, software, only about 11% at that time, uh, using the same physical blood spot screening card and the electronic birth certificate. So again, this is a process that probably could benefit tremendously from standardization. And they recognize that in their uh, assessment of these, these parameters. And then finally, every state is going to track the EDHI goals and report to the CDC. So they wanted to make states more accountable. So um, they told the states that this was the case. Uh, it was only performed by 18 of the uh, you know, 18 of our 50 states, um, and 10 of those 18 were actually um, doing. Did, they did internal assessments of their own program, so these were you know susceptible to certain biases. And then only eight of the 18 actually presented the the report to the the CDC. So again, uh, you know if you're not having to be accountable for your results, uh, you know you're not going to get results. Um, so finally, to talk about uh, kind of what I think is also a, a, another interesting um, piece of this story is, uh, you know, this, this notion of improving the diagnostics of later onset prelingual hearing impairment. So we have, you know, the one three six model, and there's a lot of kids who pass their their newborn screen in the hospital, but will actually develop hearing loss later. And I think capturing that population has been the priority of, of you know, of everybody. Uh, this is actually an awesome article from 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which talks uh, a little bit about the history of um, new ordinary screening in the U.S. and also uh, talks a lot about this issue of ways to improve 
um, later, a diagnosis of, of later onset prelingual hearing impairment. So back in 2000, the Joint Commission actually published this list of criteria that could be used by pediatricians to say, okay, this kid is at higher risk. Even if they pass their newborn hearing screening, I should keep this on my radar. And again, uh, you know, that these are, are things, some of them are, are higher risk to begin with than they would have been, uh, you know, on the high risk register to begin with, but neurogenitor disorders were not necessarily on there, head trauma wasn't on there, and so, um, you know, educating the pediatricians about these uh, was, a, was a priority of the Joint Commission. Um, also in this paper, uh, there's these, there these really interesting pie charts that highlight kind of the different etiologies of uh, hearing impairment at birth versus at four years of age. And I'll call your attention to three um, areas where there are big discrepancies. Uh, the first is this uh, genetic mutation, MTA, uh, 1555G, which confers an extreme sensitivity to immunoglycosides. Um, in the U.S., the prevalence at four years is uh, just 1% of the hearing impaired population. In Spain, it's 15%. So um, this is one genetic test that could potentially identify these kids. Also, the Pendrid genes. So only 3% of deaf kids uh, who are identified at birth have Pendrids but fully 12% of four-year-olds uh, with, um, or of four-year-old deaf kids have, have some form of Pendrin gene, or of the, of the Pendrins. And then also late onset uh, cytomegalovirus. So uh, there's a huge emergence of a, of a later onset population with that condition as well. So um, as I said, in terms of, uh, you know, genetic considerations, if in addition to you know, newborn physiologic measures of newborn screening, if, if some of these genetic measures could be incorporated in uh, certain populations, I think uh, that could be a potential uh, way of capturing some of these kids that are falling through the cracks. And one really cool thing in this paper is they have this diagram showing all the cloned genes inside the, the cochlea here. And there are literally dozens and dozens of genes that could potentially uh, be involved in, in loss of unknown etiology and as we're getting um, as, as genetic uh, as DNA sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper you know now we have the you know, 23 and me and get that for a thousand dollars it's only gonna get cheaper with time if we could simply screen all these alleles uh, and identify kids um, you know it's another another possibility to think about so in summary um, today I, I hopefully made the case that early hearing detection and intervention is important. Um, gave you kind of an overview of the evolution of screening technology as well as how it was implemented in the US and then talked about uh, some of the obstacles and areas that we have room for growth. So you know the question is is the, the glass half empty or half full? I think um, the strides made in the last 20 years <coughs> in, in newborn hearing screening are uh, really phenomenal but we do have a huge you know a, a huge amount of room to grow. So. I'll end with a quote by Helen Keller. This no talk is complete without a Helen Keller quote. Um, <laughs> no pessimist ever discovered the secret of the stars or sailed to an uncharted land or opened a new doorway for the human spirit. And I like that quote because uh, um, this is Marion Downs on her 93rd birthday, skydiving. <laughs> I think it's people like Marion Downs and, and people who really believe, you know, they, they don't ask you know, what are the reasons that we can't do this, but basically, what are the ways we can make it happen? And I think, you know, bringing newborn hearing screening uh, into full, you know, into full effect here in the United States, and then also translating that into developing countries is, is going to take a lot of optimism. But I think we've shown here in this country that it's doable, and I think, um, you know, it's, it certainly deserves energy. So with that, thank you. Very good. It should be noted that uh, Charlie Bluestone, the otolaryngologist who published with Jack Paradise, was his uh, enabler. And that's why I wonder if there was so much dissension because one of our boys got, got his, his hands sticky. You know, I, I actually had a chance to train with Fred Bass in the 90s who wrote a position statement with Jack Paradise, I think in 94, stating that uh, it wasn't the right time for universal hearing screening. 
And Fred Best was a really prominent pediatric cardiologist. <coughs> it was interesting in talking with Fred because his issue with it was basically that certain facets of the science actually hadn't been done yet. Like, I don't consider coincidence a lot of the data that she showed came from the late 90s because what Fred's big point was, we said, look, he's like, we're only going to get one shot to do this, you know, because if we go and we screw this up, there's no way you can ever go back to Congress or anybody else and say, like, you know, let's do this again. So and at the time, I think even the, um, the Joint Commission had recommended um, using OEEs as the first line of screening, like, in 1990, and, and Fred's point was like, look, we don't even know what appropriate knowns are, you know, pediatric age, you know, for, for using OEEs as screeners. So there was a, a number of... Uh, Fred was like, you know, once if you get the science, great, I'm for it. But at the time, he just didn't feel like, you know, that that had been done yet. So I don't consider it a coincidence, you know, for example, that these papers popped up, you know, and there's several others that kind of showed up right around this time. Because people, you know, Fred took a lot of crap. I remember being at, a, uh, at an audiology conference, like in 95 or something like that. And there were literally uh, people passing out buttons saying, you know, with, uh, with a picture of a baby saying, what about my dream? You know, which yeah, no, there's there's a lot of really interesting back and forth. So yeah, so the, the, the first um, editorial was was Dr. Beth and, yeah, Paradise, and Dr. Right. Paradise together in '95, and then Paradise actually wrote another editorial in Pediatrics in 1999, yeah. reiterating his points, and, and Beth was conspicuously absent from yeah, that editorial. Cause, yeah, because Fred's point was always, you know, if we do the science, he said, I want university screening, but I want to make sure that we're if we do it, we do it right, and the science is back up. And and he said, told me later, he said, you know, look. We actually did the work, you know, and worked out a lot of the concerns that he had at that point. I don't really remember the details, but um, Eric Kazarian, when he was a resident uh, with us, wrote a paper with Bev and you looking at cost effectiveness in newborn hearing screening. And Sue Norton, um, when you're up there, is a big proponent. She's done a lot of research with using OAEs. Um, uh, with this. I don't know if you ran across any of her literature, but she's an audiologist at Seattle Children's, and she, this is one of her big things. So awesome. you're going you're gonna, to. You haven't talked to her yet. You're going to be meeting her uh, when you're up there. And Kathy's done some stuff in it too. So, so Joanne, I mean, I think um, anytime you see an adoption curve like that in healthcare, it raises a lot of questions, which is obviously was born out of this debate. But what did you? Do you have a sense of sort of what was the tipping point um, that got us from in ten years, in a decade, from less than three percent to practically a hundred percent? Was this a was it market driven? Was it technology driven? Well, Stu, there is nothing more powerful than uh -huh. the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you, Victor. <laughs> but I don't no. know, is there a sense of, you is know, there a For me, I think that's the big black box, and I'd be really curious yeah, to hear Dr. Yeah, Mesner's yeah. take on that, and also Dr. Papalka's, because when I mean, you think about just the humongous variety of pediatric right. hospitals in the U.S., and in my experience in Peru, it's even more variable. I mean, you don't have American Academy of Pediatrics putting out standardized protocols for any, you know, it's just there, there's no standardization of, of care in a lot of developing countries. And so I'm, I'm actually, I think this is an interesting application for sort of the design thinking methodology, talking with those who are on the ground and what were, the, what were those, those tipping points. So, so my opinion is that it was driven by dollars. All of these states except three are state laws, so they're, they're mandated as state laws, so they had to get through each state legislature with this, and I, I can't prove it, but I think that driving point was, if you take a child who's deaf without intervention and add up the cost it takes through high school, it comes out to some number that she... Half a million, <coughs> well, half a million over the course of their life. And but. all you need to do is um, take a, the same deaf child, intervene, appropriately and they end up going to kindergarten with all of the other normal hearing kids. Right. You, you only need to get a few of those to pay for these whole programs over over the state. Yeah. One piece that's sort of conspicuously <laughs> absent also from my presentation tonight is the impact of cochlear implant. Because this is yes. all sort of pre pre CI stuff. And I mean I think the <clears throat> the cost effectiveness of cochlear implant has been proven time and time again in spades. I mean, if you look at the um, Yoshinaga study, you know, those interventions, those kids are only getting to 80% of where they're, well, you know, they're fully hearing, um, you know, uh, mashed controls are. Whereas we, we know with early cochlear implantation, these kids are performing like normal hearing kids, so. Um, one other point, uh, there are 4 million babies born in this country per year. And that 99% is the 99% of that 4 million including states, and there are a fair number of them I won't mention, who have uh, at-home births 
very high percentage, it's 15, 20% of the babies born in some states are home births. So the screening had to be developed to take the screening out to the homes as well. But it's an I, astonishing I, number. I, I would argue also that I think I think some of it was uh, a mixture of technology and education. You know, like I mean, a lot of audiologists at the time, I don't think even really knew consistently how to do ABR testing, let alone OEDs, let alone like what a good norm, for like what a passing OED would be. So there was a lot of work done at that time, and I think kind of once people realized, like, you can do this stuff, it's pretty straightforward, then that helped to explain the, uh, at least in my opinion, explain the uh, part of the spike in adoption. Are there any risk factors for uh, hearing problems in newborn? Yeah. Um, so the Joint Commission basically published, let me see if I can find the slide where they list the There's a, there's a, a large handful of uh, these ones. So parental concern actually was added relatively late to the list, but it's a, a pretty high sensitivity factor. Family history. Um, Stigmata of other syndromes, postnatal infections, including bacterial meningitis, uh, the torches infections, uh, hyperbilirubinemia, um, other syndromes, Usher syndrome, neurofibromatosis, um, neurodegenerative disorders, head trauma, and then uh, recurrent middle ear infections. John, I just want to say this was a wonderful talk. I mean, not, an, not only incredible review, but a lot of primary source material and really interactive with quotes and wonderful. So, so we've made a lot of progress, but there's a long ways to go. And the issue is the screening is working, but like you kind of pointed out, the follow-up has a lot to <laughs> improve upon. We continually and still get a lot of delayed referrals from audiologists that even though they diagnosed it early, they don't recognize what should be done. So this training, our audiologists out there, in the, especially in the Valley, we see it a lot. It's incredible. And so we'll get kids that won't come in to see us and for an implant eval until they're four. And they may have been deaf since birth. And it's just, it's incredible how hard it is to change the way people practice healthcare. <laughs> and even though the science is there, the practical implication of getting it to work is so hard. Really, really nice talk. Thank you for Very hearing good. I was gonna ask Anna, but she's not here. The big battle with the, uh, the language versus sign it goes on even in the Bay Area. Is that still a big battle, or, or, or are we winning? I don't think I can comment on that kind of globally. But here, um, here in the Bay Area, globally we've won. Here, it's still a little bit of fighting. <laughs> <laughs> You're a powerful, powerful lobby. Yeah, they are very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we watched a video actually about this this very issue. And, uh, yeah. I think that's another piece of the puzzle. Wonderful talk. Okay.